very, very excited. I come to this right here. So Dr. Joshua Eskenazi Levy, he is an assistant professor of neurosurgery, director of neurosurgical oncology at the Vivian L. Smith Department of Neurosurgery, McGovern Medical School and UT. He is uh, also an assistant professor in the Center for Precision Health. He's going to be talking about a topic uh, that it's been sort of in the minds of so many of us. And, and, and Joshua doesn't know, but there's a guy by the name of uh, Gianrico Ferrujek, who's now the CEO for the entire system. He's a GI expert. He worked with another junior faculty, Art Bader, and Art came and gave a talk. So we've been talking, and actually Rawan in our team at one point began to do some of this work and trying to understand this gut brain axis and opportunities. And when I heard that Yasha was doing this work, I felt we, we saw each other at the CNS. I felt that it was important for people to not only connect with him and here, but also potentially our fellows and residents to see if we can build more bridges and understand how we can test some of these. We have over 50 primary human cell lines that we have completely you know, uh, worked up uh, and we have over uh, here alone at uh, Mayo over 1,000 samples from brain tumor patients that we have collected over the last uh, five years that we established our Mayo Florida Human Biobank, the most robust bank uh, uh, that we have. So hopefully we can build bridges on this. Joshua, you'll see he's also a graduate from Anahuac. We have at least two Anahuac graduates here, Joshua, Andres and Paola. You know, you, hopefully you'll get a chance to connect with them. They're gonna connect with you. Then Joshua spent uh, time doing research and then he went to Mayo and did an internship in 2008, 2009. I've been following his career. We connected back then when I was at Hopkins. I was, I've been watching him. He went on to UT Texas to do his um, residency. We connected again when he was there and I was a visiting professor. And then of course, since then he's done an amazing amount of work. Then he was looking for surgical neuro-oncology fellowship he also looked at our fellowship that we had at Hopkins. We reconnected there. And then since then, I've been watching his career. And, uh, and of course, delighted to see him uh, getting also uh, in the level of promotions. I, I've been blessed to be able to help in one way or another with a lot of our colleagues around the world in their own promotions. Multiple awards, multiple honors, extraordinary publications. You'll see his H index already, 21 extraordinary amount of accomplishments and influence in the literature. And of course, what you don't get to see is this um, person that I got to see over the years, very kind, very gentle, very caring, uh, always uh, thinking about, you know, how can he continue to build bridges? And I know that as a surgeon, he's got a great reputation. He's leading the oncology, you know, program there and uh, at a very, very young age in his career. So we're blessed to have you. Josh, I'm going to stop sharing right here so we can uh, let you go. You know, they put our program already. So... Please take it away. We're delighted to have you here this morning with us. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for those uh, beautiful words. I, I, I really appreciate it. And, and uh, you know, I mean, it's an honor to be here and see what a phenomenal team uh, of young people you guys have. And as you said, um, I'll be talking about something that is sort of uh, out of the mind of neurosurgeons and surgeons in particular. He's going to be talking about the glioma and the gut-brain axis. And uh, just to say a few words, this is almost 15 years ago, but I, 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 I've been at the Mayo Clinic and, and if there's one thing that I really learned uh, that I carry on into my clinical practice is that the needs of the patient come first. And, and that's really helped me to develop my practice. And you can see how proud I am that I saved my batch. So um, definitely the beach seems more attractive than the snow, but uh, you know, it was a wonderful opportunity. So, um, the human microbiome, I'll say a few words just uh, for everyone. It's pretty much the microorganisms that live in and on us. And I always show this picture, no matter how much hand washing we do, this is the way our hands are always gonna look. And what determines our microbiome is pretty much many things, uh, where we come from, uh, how are we doing in terms of stress? Um, how is our diet? Are we having a high fiber diet? There are very well described age-related changes in the microbiome as we uh, get old. And obviously other things such as antibiotics or exercise have huge effects of our microbiome. But what's interesting is that the GI tract harbors uh, millions of microorganisms and about 99% of our genes in our body are actually microbial. So they must be doing a lot of things and about there's 150 times more bacterial genes that human genes. 
And the gut microbiome plays a critical role in several functions, such as intestinal metabolism, antigen diversity, and immunity. And this axis has been very well described as a bi-directional communication that will integrate neural, hormonal, and several immunological signals. And it will communicate because all of these bacteria are releasing molecules, particularly short-chain fatty acids, several catecholamines and, and, and metabolites. And these are almost exclusively derived from the bacterial metabolism in the gut. The most common short-chain fatty acids are butyrate, propionate, acetate, and they've been described to have several functions in many neurological diseases. There is huge microbial diversity in the human gut, uh, but the majority of the species, about 98%, belong to four divisions, particularly Firmicutes, Bacteroides, Proteobacteria, and Acinobacteria. And you'll hear about some of this. And the rest are composed of a very diverse uh, number of bacteria. And the way we looked at microbiomes is pretty much by looking at diversity, uh, alpha diversity, which is the micros within one sample. And we look at richness and evenness, and then we looked at beta diversity when we're comparing samples between each other. So this is just an image. You know, if you have a small number of bacteria, then that's a low richness environment. And, and you know, if you have several bacteria and they're very even, you have many bacteria, but there are very uh, many of the same kind, then it's a very good sample. And when there is not that balance, we talk about a dysbiosis, which is pretty much a reduction in microbial diversity. And this is some of the uh, figures that we put for a, for a, a paper, the gut-brain axis, which is integrating a communication with several functions. You can see here all the uh, neurotransmitters, tryptophan, serotonin, the gut, and, and the gut epithelium is very diverse. And, and then you have through output of many cells, including the dendritic cells, immune cells, and that's what's really gonna compromise all these functions. And you've heard recently that there has been a huge impact of the gut microbiome in cancer therapy, particularly in melanoma, as well as in lung cancer. And it's been recently described that the microbiome influences response and toxicity across a range of treatments, particularly chemotherapy, such as um, alkylating agents, cyclophosphamide, checkpoint blockade, particularly PD-1, and in the setting of stem cell transplantation, where different gut microbiome signatures between patients will translate into different responses. And this is a very important uh, paper that came about the time that we're uh, starting some of our experiments, where the gut microbiome was found to modulate the response to anti PD1 immunotherapy in melanoma patients. And this is pretty much uh, what they did is that they found differences in diversity and composition of patients that responded to PD-1 inhibition. As you know, melanoma patients, a large number of them have good responses, but in some patients, they develop resistance. And they found by looking at patient samples that when there was increased diversity and abundance of particular species, those patients were associated with better responses. And eventually they found that this was related to anti-tumor immunity in patients who had a favorable microbiome. And now at the same time, this very interesting paper also came about looking at epithelial cancers, particularly lung and renal, where they found that if the patient during the immunotherapy treatment were exposed to antibiotics, those patients did much worse. So therefore they found the antibiotics compromise the efficacy of PD-1 blockade, which is quite important and that the primary resistance was attributed to an abnormal gut microbiome. Interestingly, they also identified some bacteria that correlated with better response to treatment. This is a, for instance, acromantia, which is an enterobacteria, and they found that patients that had increased abundance fare much better in terms of survival and several immune functions. And, and then we've been thinking about, obviously, this is sort of what we do. Uh, we deal with glioma, which is a very unfortunate disease, the most common and lethal. 50% of the patients present with a glioblastoma. And patients in trials do between 14, 20 months. But if you like population databases in the real world, these patients are living about 10 months. The treatment is standard of care, resection, thimosolamide radiotherapy. And unfortunately, we can always we cannot always resect all the tumors, but we do as much as we can. 
And we wanted to study the relationship between glioma and the gut-brain axis. So um, we also wanted to learn how the gut microbiome responded and interacted with timozolamide, which is an alkylated agent, agent and is the most commonly uh, prescribed medication, which is given oral for all these patients. And we wanted to know how uh, glioma development and chemotherapy affected the microbiome in both animal models as well as in patients. And also we wanted to see if we could identify some microbiome signatures that would uh, mean that those patients would do better. These are some of our initial experiments. Uh, this is some of the design and the stool sample collection protocol. We use C57 BL6 mice and uh, the GL261 uh, cell line is very common. It's not the best cell line to study glioma, but we implanted the cells and then we collected stool samples sequentially uh, on the mice, as you can see, before we implanted the tumor, then we let the tumor go. Typically, it takes about two weeks. Then we collected another sample, and then we treated mice. We had a saline group, a timodar group. We gave the temozolomide orally, which is challenging sometimes. Most studies have given it IP. And as expected, this cell line responds well to timozolomide. The mice that underwent treatment fared better. And, and then we did a lot of analysis. So. Interestingly, we, we found that glioma induces a dysbiosis in the mice microbiome. This is uh, an image where you can see the GL261 implantation. We let the tumor grow. We gave the mice saline, and then we sacrificed them, and we analyzed the samples before and after the tumor grew. And as you can see here from this is just a beta diversity plot, you can see when we compare the first sample before the tumor grow and the last sample, there were separation and clustering separation of the samples. We also looked at the most common bacteria, which is Firmicus and Bacteriorius. So we looked at ratios. And as you can see, before the tumor grew and after, there was a significantly decrease in the Firmicus to Bacteriorius ratio. And then when we start looking at abundance of particular bacteria, we find some differences here between the first and the last sample. We identify that the levels of vericomicrobia increase with a corresponding decrease in firmicus. Typically, there is an environment. So when you have one bacteria that goes up, someone else changes. And when we follow them, we use 16S RNA sequencing, which is one of the most common techniques to study the microbiome. We then looked at the family level and the genus, and we identified that the levels of acromantia and acromantia were also significantly increased after the tumor group. Now, we, we looked at those mice that underwent temozolamide. So Differently from the last one, which were treated with saline. Again, we compared the, the, the samples before and after all this happened. And while we did find some beta uh, diversity changes and clustering changes, we no longer saw any changes in the Firmicus to Bacteriorius ratio. Most importantly, we didn't see any changes in those bacteria that change after the glioma cells grew, after the tumor uh, uh, took effect, um, or any changes in acromantia or acromantia. And the question is, well, could the timozola might be affecting some of these changes? And then we looked at a sham group. Um, we just gave in timodar just to see how the gut microbiome would change after this. And indeed, we saw some beta separate, you know, clustering differences. We also saw some changes between uh, before and after the timozola at the FB ratios. But none of these changes were related to vericomicrobia or any of the other uh, bacteria that we described. We saw some changes at the ruminococca family and the muricobacia. And, and so this is sort of the first uh, study. Uh, there, was, there hasn't been anything before that. And, and again, as I said before, the bacteria are doing a lot of things. They're producing metabolites, short-chain fatty acids, there's back to of neurotransmitters, immune cells. So we did, again, some several experiments where we, again, use a GL261 cell. And now we focus on the stool short-chain fatty acids. So we looked at targeted metabolomic profiling. And again, this is before and after the tumor in a saline model on the left side and on a timozolamide model on the right side. And as you can see here, before and after, we can identify at least 12 metabolites that were downregulated, particularly some of the short chain fatty acids, butyrate, propionate, and acetate. And again, some other neurotransmitters, serotonin, and other uh, metabolites that were increased. But interestingly, in the temozolamide model, we only see a very few changes in these metabolites, which is some sort of similar to what we saw with the timo timozolamide. And the thought is that 
is having an excellent effect on the tumor model, and therefore these changes are not being seen. The axis is not being disrupted that much. And alongside all these experiments, we, uh, which, as, as you know, take, they take a long time, we started collecting samples on our patients. And it's actually very challenging. It's much easier to collect any other sample than to collect stool. So, you know, our practice patterns in Houston are not that similar to what you see in terms of referrals, but, you know, we have a lot of patients that come with very large tumors that we have to take to surgery, and we want to take those patients quickly. So we find the tumor and we collect a sample before the surgery, because as you know, these patients will get antibiotics during the operation and, and therefore the microbiome is going to have a huge change. We then resect the tumor and then we follow in standard chemo radiotherapy. We wanted to learn also what happened with the microbiome as a consequence of the temozolomide in humans and the radiation. So we collected a sample before and after six weeks. And these are some of the results. Now for humans, we use uh, controls, uh, typically healthy people or uh, household members. And these are some of the, we're now talking about IDH wild type tumors, which are the typical glioblastomas. And as you can see here, there's clustering separation, which was significant between the controls and the IDH wild type gliomas at the time of the diagnosis. We also found that compared to the controls, there was a significant decrease in the Firmicutes to bacteroides ratio. And then when we looked at abundance, we also found similarities be, uh, between our mice experiments. We found that the levels of varicomicrobia significantly increase in IDH wild type patients compared to controls, corresponding decrease in firmicus and other changes. And then we will look uh, subsequent taxonomical levels, which we can go all the way up to the genus species when we do 16S. Uh, if you do shotgun sequencing, you can go all the way to species. Uh, so here we, we also found acromantia and acromantia that were uh, significantly increased after in, in those patients. Interesting, this is kind of unexpected, but uh, in about 40 patients or so uh, where we collect the sample before and after chemo radiation, there was absolutely no change. This is pre-chemotherapy, post-chemotherapy samples, no changes at the beta diversity level, no changes in the uh, pre and post-chemo at the firmicus to bacteria ratio. This was surprising in humans, but uh, again, the human microbiome is quite complex, and this is something that we're uh, still investigating. It, and, and it, Joshua, yeah. yeah, can I ask a quick question? Can you pass back to that slide? Because for me, what I was thinking about, I'm not surprised that this is what you found. To be honest with you, what I was more interested in is: is there a difference in the gut microbiome of those patients that have cancer versus the controls, i.e., epilepsy, vascular lesions? any of the healthy population? Because that's what I'd be more interested in, because I think that change already happened even before you started the chemo and the radiation. Chemo radiation may exacerbate, but did you have that comparison? So we have, we have, we do have, we have healthy, uh, this is a comparison of patients uh, with IDH wild type tumors, uh, about 39 patients, and controls, which is healthy people, uh, healthy young people, and household controls, because you have to understand that we're seeing a huge variety, the diversity here in Houston. We have patients from Vietnam, uh, China, Hispanics, African-Americans, the diets are very different. So we use the uh, family controls, uh, as, as, uh, which is critical. And we did find some changes in those populations. We have not done uh, comparisons with vascular diseases or epilepsy, but that's certainly something that, that we're considering doing. Um, and, um, and this is just putting something together in terms of everything that's happened. After this uh, work, there's been uh, one or two other additional works from Europe and, and another investigator in the US where they found that in the setting of antibiotics that um, they induce natural kill, uh, killer cell impairment. And you can see here some of the hypothesis that is happening in the short chain fatty acids, some of these neurotransmitters. So now taking this research further, as, uh, as we said, we've collected a large amount of samples you know, over hundreds of samples now. But uh, again, we wanted to focus on a group of patients that we follow closely that underwent chemo radiation with maximal surgical resection. And here we looked at almost 40 patients. So we, we looked at the baseline sample before the surgical intervention. And we separated patients between short-term and long-term survivors according to the median uh, survival time. 
and we did a LEFC analysis, which is a very good biomarker discovery tool, a lineal discrimination analysis. And you can see that we identified at least six and five taxa that correlated with survival in those uh, populations. And further analysis of the survival identified, for instance, that Bernicellasia family, you know, that the levels correlated with survival. Now, because age is such, a, such an important factor in glioma outcomes and the microbiome, we just focus on a uh, match sample. This is very, uh, you know, match patients with age and other clinical characteristics. Here we're just talking, it's a small group, nine and nine patients, but again, short and long-term survivors. And again, we identified at least four taxa that correlated with worse outcomes. Here's 10 months versus 20 months, which is quite significant for this uh, disease. And subsequent analysis of the abundance confirmed the findings that, for instance, the, level, the levels of lacnospiralis, lacnospiracea, and family ruminococca were associated with worse survival. So those are the short-term uh, survivors. And subsequent uh, univariate analysis demonstrated that uh, levels of lacnospiracea, you know, if you've had higher levels at the time of initial diagnosis, those patients would do worse. And the question again is, why is this? So we, we then trying to focus on microbiome signatures because it's not gonna be one bacteria. It's gonna be a combination of things that are happening in the, in the gut or in our bodies. So we looked at, now we apply that discovery tool into 48 GBM IDH wild type patients. These were all treated with maximal safe resection chemo radiotherapy. And we looked at the lacnospiralis low level um, and the bacteroidalis high level. So if they corresponded to that group, we said yes. And we analyzed those patients. And as you can see, the patients that uh, had a back, higher bacteroidalis, low lactospiralis, lived 20 months versus 11 months. And that was adjusted and it was still significant for age, which is important for microbiome and, and glioma survival and the Karnowski performance score. Uh, so then we looked at short chain fatty acid analysis in the stool of those same patients. And here you can see this is the bacteroidalis high, lacnospiralis low patients. So those are uh, the patients that are, uh, that are doing better. And interestingly, we found at least three metabolites, such as isovalerate, 2-methylbutyrate, and isobutyrate, that were decreasing those patients. And this is something that we're investigating. We have to understand better. And now, moving uh, a little bit off, uh, in addition to studying the gut microbiome, we're studying the uh, tumor microbiome. And this is a very interesting uh, manuscript that came from a uh, rabbit Strassman group and Jennifer Wargo where they found and they identified, they did an analysis of the microbiomes of several types of tumors across very different things, such as bone, pancreas, glioma. They have about 40 patients from two institutions and many others. And interestingly, contrary to what has always been thought, it seems like each tumor type has a distinct microbiome composition. And when they looked at these samples, now I have to say this was done on the paraffin blocks which as you may imagine, are not very sterile. So they found, you know, they had a very complicated, uh, complex decontamination algorithm to get rid of the most common bacteria and end up with a very small amount of potential candidates because 99% of them are contaminants. And they also found that intratumoral bacteria can be intracellular, can be in the cancer and immune cells. And this is something interesting. Uh, what, what is that bacteria doing? And this is very descriptive uh, manuscript. So, you know, we took out some of that research further. This is uh, some of the graph from that paper uh, where they found in, in GBM, particularly proteobacteria, firmicus, actinobacteria. And these are about preliminary samples from the same patients that we've already sequenced the stool, the, we've done metabolite analysis. We also have the plasma. We collected the frozen sample from the operating room and it was just, the tumor was just frozen right away. So we assume that it's gonna be a very clean sample. And this is very preliminary data that we're showing. We're actually working extensively because we wanna make sure that what we're finding is accurate. Re this manuscript was done from paraffin. This is done from frozen tissue. And interestingly, we see some similarities. But we're running into a lot of issues because you know we, this is very complex bioinformatic analysis that we're partnering with uh, several groups. 
everything has bacteria. The reagents used for the DNA uh, extraction, the pipettes, everything is possible. So we have to decontaminate everything to really understand what we're seeing. And uh, now we, this is on the paraffin blocks from these same patients. So we're trying to identify um, immune cells, CD3, CD8, and CD68, and we can do it. We're gonna do some uh, LPS for uh, gram-positive uh, membrane bacteria. But now our focus is trying to understand what is the relationship between that potential tumor microbiome and the tumor microenvironment. And what is that doing to the immune cell and potentially to the glioma growth and the role that these may have in glioma therapy, such as chemotherapy, immunotherapy, and radiation. So obviously this work takes many years, a lot of effort from a lot of uh, people, but so far we've learned that the gut microbiome represents a new and relatively unexplored area. We uh, further mechanistic studies are needed to assess its clinical um, relevance and future studies need to be done to evaluate interactions between the gut microbiome and the glioma therapies. We've done some work on Timodar. We've done some work on immune checkpoint inhibitors as well. And we're collaborating with other people. And we have very interesting uh, data on oncolytic herpes virus where we find that in the setting of antibiotics, the effect of the virus is completely lost. And this is depending on the microbiome. So this is some data that we're working with with an oncolytic uh, therapist here at UT. And, and again, looking at relationship between gut microbiome, tumor microbiome, and the tumor microenvironment. And, and, and this is, uh, there's a lot of work to do. And, and I appreciate a lot of mentorship from, from very uh, bright and, and energetic people. Uh, Luis, Balvin, one of our, this Antonio, who's from El Salvador, spent a few years in the lab and he's a resident now and he's done a lot of this work. And from the prime uh, group, uh, Jennifer, Nadim, and, and Leo, uh, so uh, certainly this is a uh, work that I could not do by myself. Um, and um, I'll, I'll be happy to take any questions. I really appreciate that. And I hope you, you found this work uh, interesting. Beautiful work, Joshua, beautiful. There are some questions, if you don't mind, if you can you know, uh, take a few questions. We have a few minutes, at least uh, seven minutes or so for some questions. And I saw already Dr. Uh, De Diaz, who's one of our Fellows, Gaetano, do you want to go ahead and uh, ask your question? And yes, feel sir. free to raise your hand, anybody who, who wants to, we'll, I'll call upon you. Thank you so much, Dr. Eskenazi. Very interesting talk and very hot topic. I have a quick question about when you talk the, about the gut microbiome being predictive about outcome and survival for GBM, was that the baseline microbiome before the surgery? And also when you did the match, did you also account just for age or also for like baseline KPS, tumor location and other outcomes? In the so, so it was it was the baseline sample uh, before the antibiotics were given at the time of initial diagnosis. And we accounted for age, KPS. We did not account for tumor location or volume because then the, the sample size will be extremely low. Um, so this is, again, a uh, we use that by biomarker discovery tool. And then we're trying to apply what we're finding there into larger uh, cohorts. Again, we have to have significant follow-up. We, we started this 2017, 2018. So a majority of those 40 patients, uh, you know, many of them have already died, but then uh, we've collected since at least uh, 50 or a hundred more samples. Yeah. Thank you. And do you think it's more of a causative relationship or so is the different microbiome that may Somehow, somehow related to the longer survival or is it because they are doing better? Yeah, that's a very good uh, question. We don't know, but uh, we hypothesize that potentially the different microbiomes at initial diagnosis may have a meaning uh, in terms of the immune system, inflammation, and potentially would make therapies more uh, responsive, let's say probably be more responsive to chemotherapy or the, the tumor may be more sensitive to radiation. We have to do a lot of now tumor microenvironment related work uh, to really investigate this. So it's a work in, pro in progress. Thank you so much. Thank you, Gaetano. Let's pivot right now to Dr. Henry Ruiz Garcia, who's also one of our fellows in our laboratory, originally from Peru, which they have a different diet over there, every different country, but go ahead, Henry. Yes, thank you, sir. Amazing talk, Dr. Eskenazi, congratulations. I just was wondering if you are looking into 
the relationship between the uh, the microbiome and the specific phenotype of the immune cells in the tumor microenvironment. I mean, the relationship between T regulators, N1 versus M2 macrophages, etc. Because there may be an exciting interaction there. Yeah, that's that. Uh, we just started doing this, as you see. We started doing some immunos, but again, we're going to start doing more complicated. You know, we're waiting for some grant and, and bigger uh, funding so that we can do potentially uh, flow uh, after the tumor is resected or single cell sequencing. But uh, we have that in mind, and certainly that's a great uh, thought that we now we need to learn more about what's happening in the tumor. Yeah, and we we'll also want to see how you doing. To see what changes are also in the population that is in the circulation as well, because there is an interaction between immune cells and circulation in the tumor. Maybe. Yeah, yeah I mean, all, all that can be done. We have sample, we have the plasma for these patients, we've collected PBMCs. Uh, so, all that is going to happen. Obviously, as you know, this, this work is expensive and, 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 and we're in the process of applying for much bigger, you know, we're trying to get an R01 now. And, uh, you know, more uh, meaningful uh, funding so that we can take this research to the next level. Thank you so much. And, and just so you know, Josh, so we spend, you know, about $600,000 a year and the biobank that we have here at, I had it at Hopkins when I was there and I transferred about 2,000 samples here. But once I got here, really the team took us to the next level. That's what the Mayo Clinic is known for in the labs, as you know, we keep samples from 155 years ago for our patients. So our biobank, so every patient that goes into that brain room with a brain tumor gets, not every patient, but the ones that we selected, and we're not most recently selected also meningiomas, pituitaries, and other tumors, but we collect blood intraoperatively, we collect the tumor before, blood after, before, and we specifically store that blood to be able to collect DNA, RNA, anything protein so they uh, that's where a lot of expenses come in we of course we have the infrastructure with all the coordinators consent because you know how strict yeah. the mayo clinic is with all the rec records that we keep in all our patients so we have over a thousand samples right now that we have collected many cell lines that have been characterized over 50 right now with the appropriate animal models as well so we know how they behave we know the type of tumors so one point for your grants, for your collaborative efforts, this is the idea of creating bridges. So I'm going to pivot right now to Anna Carrano, who's one of our young junior faculty right here in the laboratory. Anna, go ahead, take it away. Um, good morning, everybody. Uh, very fascinating and interesting talk. I was surprised, like you said, that the chemotherapy didn't show any effect. And I wonder how long was the therapy for? And if you follow up later on, I think it's important if you have like an internal control and like you can show changes in the microbiome within a patient, maybe before surgery, after surgery, after therapy, even though they are on antibiotics. Uh, if you can show that the antibiotic changes the microbiome, I think it's important that you can follow-up changes in a patient through a treatment? I don't know if you will look at it. Yeah, we looked at that for about 40 patients. We collected a sample before surgery, then uh, mm -hmm. four weeks uh, after and uh, before the chemo radiation and six weeks later. And what we found is that the microbiome recovers about three weeks or so. So, uh, and as we described before, after the antibiotics, uh, we saw that it, uh, uh, the fourth week sample was very similar to the baseline sample, but the six, the, the, after six weeks from chemo radiation, the sample was exactly the same as the baseline sample. And that was sort of unexpected, uh, but then we didn't continue to follow uh, mm -hmm. more samples, you know, because we wanna sort of focus our resources in the most critical samples. But again, we have a few patients that we collected samples when the tumor came back. Uh, now, could it be that the, the microbiome is stable when the tumor is stable and then something else happens after mm -hmm. the tumor becomes more aggressive. We collected some samples on patients who undergo a vastin. Uh, so, you know, uh, it, it's yeah, just- Yeah, I wonder, I wonder if maybe it changes earlier um, and then it stabilizes after six weeks. So like you said, maybe the body gets used to the treatment. I don't know, or maybe yeah. they are 
are they taking any probiotics during treatment or no, not none of these patients so we we excluded patients that had okay. inflammatory bowel disease that were taking antibiotics probiotics all okay. those things were excluded so in about 48 patients or so at least we did not find that the temozolomide and the radiation change. changed the microbiome to any significant extent but this has to be validated and, and mm. uh, investigated with larger cohorts. Still very, very interesting. And then another question is like, um, maybe I, I, it's just because I don't know enough about this, but how the microbiome within, within the tumor microenvironment develop, where is it coming from? Yeah, that's a great question, right? So. I mean, no one ever thought that there would be bacteria in the tumor, right? right? Now, these are not live bacteria. You can grow these bacteria. And if it wasn't because of sequencing techniques, we would never be able to find this. Now, the question is, could it be a traveling microbiome, right? Could you have some translocation of bacteria into the blood brain, into the blood? And then because the blood brain barrier is disrupted, at some point during the tumor evolution, there were some bacteria and you can identify the DNA fragments of the bacteria. Now, what is that doing? Is that triggering something? Is that affecting the immune system? And no one has done this. So we are very interested in this. But again, I do want to make sure that the data is accurate. That paper from, that was published in Nature, it's, it's a phenomenal paper. But again, it's the first one that's been done. And it was done on paraffin. So we are actually working with that same group, uh, with the Prime TR group, with Jennifer Wargo group and, and Ajami. And we're trying to see if we, if it's actually truth. And if it is, we want to narrow it down to some bacteria, eliminate everything that's a contaminant, and then see why are these bacteria being related to the tumor. Now, we're also studying the plasma microbiome. So I didn't show that data. We're also studying the cerebrospinal fluid microbiome. Uh, it's a lot of data, but again, we're finding some bacteria in the plasma and the cerebrospinal fluid of these patients. Now, is this potentially the same bacteria that we find in the tumor? And, you know, I don't wanna put any firm conclusions because this is very, very early work. Okay, very, very Beautiful. awesome work you guys are doing. Thank you. Beautiful work. Thank you, Anna, and thank you, Joshua. I know, to be respectful, I know that you have a meeting at 8.05 with our faculty and this morning. We thank you for spending a a couple of hours this morning with all of us. We have over 60 participants, seven different countries, according to Gaetano de Viase, countries from Colombia, Dominican Republic, Ecuador, Italy, Mexico, Panama, and of course, several cities in the United States. So thank you, Joshua. We look forward. We have, we, uh, Andres put the, on the schedule right there. Your staff for this morning. I'll see you in a few minutes, but we thank you. Hopefully in the future, we'll get you in person right here. So we'll uh, thank you for getting. I think there's a Andres. There's a different link. There's another that link. Yes. going to go to yeah. the link. Yes, beautiful. Yeah. So thank you for spending. Thank your you for the us. invitation. It was so fantastic. Much. Really, really appreciate it. What a wonderful yeah. fascinating. Thing. And I'll see you, and I'll yeah. see you in a few minutes as well. All right. Good. Thank you. Good week.